I would say that Cynthia Bringle is a rock. Solid as a rock. You know, that is, that's her personality. She is like the strength and the spirit of Penland. She's one of the anchors of our artistic community and has inspired many of the other potters. I wedge this clay a little bit at home, but I will admit to being a lazy wedger. She came to Penland in the 60s, and she was one of the first to sort of seize on the, the idea that Penland had altered her life to a degree that she wanted to give back a lot. So I think a number of you have been in my studio, so you know that I just make a lot of different kinds of pots, and I always say I'm a production potter, but it simply means I produce to make a living. You know, Cynthia really is the, the mother of this place, at least the one that's here and living. I mean, she's, I call her my craft mama. So, okay, this is going to be a small uh, honey pot or sugar bowl. So I'm going to take this top rim, hold these fingers, thumb and the finger here, and press down with the left hand, holding with the thumb in the back. Cynthia's generosity, her kindness, her ability to support us in the community is really a huge, a huge gift to all of us. Cynthia and Fenland are practically one, synonymous. Penland is our home, and when you come to Penland, you're coming partially to Cynthia's home. Cynthia, you know, is the mayor of Penland. I moved here because I wanted to live in a community where there are other craftspeople, and I felt like that this would become that. This community has really grown through the years, and it's because of Penland School that people have settled around here. Cynthia is one of dozens of working craftspeople who have come to this area because of an affiliation with the school and then decided they were going to stay. Um, there are several hundred working studios just within a 15 or 20 mile radius of the school. What is important is to understand that Lucy Morgan, who is the founder of Penland, was at the table at the beginning, but with a group of people. Um, they were all affected by this Southern Appalachian missionary movement, which frequently had its focus through crafts, because it was through crafts that you could um, generate economic development. I mean, this is an isolated community. They needed dollars. So craft objects were the, the ideal way. It kept a woman close to her family, but still doing something that she could um, improve the quality of her family's life. And that ideal is why Penland's here. And it's the same ideal that, you know, that is still is the backbone of what's going on here. At that point in time, not unlike now, there was a, a, a complete breakdown in the economy with very little work to be found. And so they looked to craft as an economic engine, just like we in 2007 are looking to craft as an economic engine. And it was as viable then as it is viable now. It's pretty amazing. Lucy Morgan, she and her peers were completely unconcerned with traditional feminine decorum. They were not concerned with the social norms of their time. They were concerned with making a difference and you could not make a difference yourself if you had all those other trappings weighing you down. I think there's a point of comparison there. 
Cynthia has made a difference. Well, if you come over, I'm here and I'll help you do it. Okay? All right. Cynthia, in many ways, she's a fitting descendant to these women. She's fiercely independent. She is so geared toward changing the lives of her students. She's very concerned with empowering them. I think that there are many similarities between her and a number of these women that were really agents of change in their time. When I first came to Penland, which was Bill Brown's first summer here, I just came to help him for a couple of weeks. I was in the car with Cynthia and ended up coming up the hill to Penland. And I said, this car won't make it. I was driving. Cynthia said, shift. Well, my father said, um, you could choose to do whatever you want. Just do it the best you can. He said, I don't care if you dig ditches, just do a good job. I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. My um, father was a doctor, an obstetrician, and a gynecologist. And my mother took care of all of us. My sister and I were the first. Cynthia and I are twins, and she'll say I kicked her out because we're 30 minutes apart. We have three brothers also. We were always told for our third birthday we were taken to the Peabody to see the ducks come out of the elevator and walk across the red carpet to get into the fountain. We were all taking piano also, but it wasn't my favorite thing to do. I'd rather get out the pencils and paper and draw. Our parents were very supportive of what we wanted to do, so we were lucky. We were sent to St. Mary's School for Girls in Suwannee, Tennessee, and it was run by the Episcopal Church and the nuns. And it was a great place. It was beautiful. It sat on a mountaintop. At St. Mary's, there were not any art classes at all. So I would take my paints and go out and just paint by myself. By then, I kind of thought I wanted to go to art school, but the thing is, you never think you're good enough to go to art school. When I went to art school, all freshmen had to take the same classes. So the first semester we took jewelry, which I liked very much, and the second semester we took a pottery class. And I got to throw on the wheel and I thought, oh, I think I'll do this again. During my second year in art school, I applied to go to Haystack and got in. My, uh, and water skiing and dislocated my shoulder. So I arrived at Haystack with my arm in a sling. Well, Bill Brown said to Fran Merritt when I arrived, well, you certainly know how to pick them. And then the next summer, I asked to be the studio assistant in Clay for the summer. And Fran Merritt says to me, well, I've never given it to a woman before. And I said to him, well, I can do the job. So he gave it to me. That was great for me because, you know, the teachers were people like M.C. Richards and Toshiko Takaezu and Bill Wyman. Ed and Mary Shire were there. So I got to study and see all those people. But when I was in art school, any can load a pot, I'd say I'd load it and I'd fire it, and that's how I learned to do it. And I learned to make pots because every spare minute I had, I'd be in the clay studio working. So they'd throw me out of the building at night, and I'd be there in the morning when the janitor opened the door, because that's what I wanted to do. One night I decided it was time to tell my parents that I wanted to change my major from painting to pottery. So we were all staying around the kitchen, and I told them that, and my father said, oh, and that's all he said. And then I found out later that he said to my mother that evening, I've raised a daughter to play in the mud. I mean, Cynthia's first sales um, were in Memphis in Mother and Daddy's backyard. I went to Alfred because I felt like I needed more time to develop, you know, so that I would know more when I wanted to set up a studio, because I knew that's what I wanted to do, even then. And Bill Brown, in his first year here, he actually started the resident artist program. And he actually
tried to get me to be a resident artist in, when I got out of graduate school. And I told him no, that I didn't want to do that. I needed to go out on my own and see if I could make it by myself. She's a curious, intelligent woman. And so she was looking at every avenue of possibility for herself. And one of those avenues was Enseca. And Enseca had just been formed. Well, it's where everything was happening in clay at the time. That's where information was exchanged. My first studio was in Eads, Tennessee. This house looked like it should have been bulldozed. So I found out there was a well and there was water. So I laid hardwood floors, I laid linoleum, I put in windows. I did everything needed to make it into a livable space. I lived there with her for a couple of years, um, and the agreement was I could live, live with her if I left every day and went to work. I'd get up in the morning, I'd have breakfast, and I'd say to myself, okay, Cynthia, get to work. And I'd go out in the studio and I would work. And I did that every day. And on the weekend, I mixed glazes for, and I actually priced all her pots in the beginning. I didn't really go anywhere or hardly or do anything else except I'd started coming to Penland to teach classes for Bill Brown. I mean, people think it's hard to be a woman in today's world. We'll think about it 40 years ago when she was starting her studio. It was really hard. I figured, okay, people have to know what I'm doing and understand it a little bit. So I started um, talking to ladies' garden clubs and book clubs. I'd have an open house. And sometimes I did raccoon firings to show them what that was. And one year my brochure said I was giving away free puppies in pots because my dog had had about 11 puppies. People would say to my father, they would say, oh, it's nice Cynthia has a hobby. And he'd say, it's not her hobby, it's her business. She was making pots uh, and doing things at a time when it was a kind of a male-dominated craft field. She was the first female studio person I'd ever met. My plan was to eventually move to Penland anyway, because every time I came up here, I never wanted to leave. So, you know, there'd be tears going down the mountain. Mm -hmm. 